All right, so we'll go ahead and get started. Um, you have come to the Future of Commerce on Drupal 8 and Beyond presentation. And I am Ryan Sarama with Commerce Guys. Um, I am a longtime community member, starting with Ubercart on Drupal 5 and even did some stuff before that. And my first blog was on Drupal 4.7, and I got my first ever freelance contract by putting up a two-page blog post about you know, QuickBooks integration. So it's always been about e-commerce, and it's been fun, and I've you know, grown and learned a lot through being a part of the Drupal community. Um, for e-commerce, uh, 2.x on Drupal 8, um, we've actually brought in a co-maintainer, um, so Boyan Zavanovich, who could not be here, so I'm presenting on his behalf, really, um, is the co-maintainer for Commerce 2. Um, with special focus on the PHP libraries that we are developing um, outside of our Drupal modules. And then I'm more focused on the actual Drupal side with entity development and all that kind of stuff. Um, but we are both um, employees at Commerce Guys. Um, Boyan works remotely from Serbia. I work remotely from South Carolina, probably very similar um, states. Um, and uh, we are the creators of, of course, both Platform.sh and Drupal Commerce. Um, Drupal Commerce itself being born in uh, you know 2010, late 2010, early 2011, um, finally launching at DrupalCon London. Um, so it's you know been around for a while, and uh, really our, our vision since the beginning um, has been for Drupal Commerce to be like the number one open source e-commerce platform in the world. It's very visionary because it's supposed to be, um, but we've always said that we power truly flexible e-commerce because you know because we're built on Drupal, anything can be altered. Nothing has to be hard coded. Um, a lot of what we do depends on rules and views and other things that can be overridden, disabled, changed, et cetera. And I'll just start now by, by providing that sort of an introduction. I'm not sure, you know, by, by show of hands, has anybody here never used Drupal Commerce on a project? It's new to a few people, yeah? Okay. Um, so the, the big idea behind Drupal Commerce is that it was built from scratch on Drupal 7 to take full advantage of Drupal's entity API. Um, so the fact that in Drupal 7 anything can be fieldable, Anything can have multiple types, and, and you can display them um, in a variety of different ways, um, including um, using views for any type of entity. Um, you know, we, we built everything around this system, so all of our administrative lists, like product lists, orders, line items, all that stuff, are built using views. So anything can be customized from the user interface and, of course, exported to code um, or altered by whatever module you use to maintain your project. Um, but both the front end and the back end and even forms. So in, in uh, Drupal Commerce on D7, um, we contributed a patch to views to allow views to render a form. So you can actually customize the shopping cart form in the same way you would customize the shopping cart block, uh, among other things that you would use views for. Um, we also use rules for all of our business logic. Um, so determining pricing, determining schedules, product availability, um, and uh, you know, payment method applicability for any different uh, order. Uh, you know, maybe based on country, you have different payment options or shipping options. All of that sort of business logic is handled via the rules module, um, although you can use equivalent uh, Drupal hooks to, to do the same things. Um, and of course, the, you know, as, as I mentioned before, the big idea here is that we wanted to hard code no business logic um, so that you didn't have to undo something that's in code in order to make Drupal Commerce work for your particular client or use case. Um, if anybody used Ubercart before on D6 or 5, you might be familiar with the fact that um, you know, everything had to be a product and a node was a product, and so you had to have a node you know, whether there was actually any need to display product data or not, um, so such as a, uh, like a, an event ticket, uh, well, like, like buying your ticket for DrupalCon. You know, it doesn't necessarily need a standalone product page. It's just a, a SKU that then gets added to the, the cart via some other form. Um, so we, we sort of tried to, to roll back a lot of the, the hard-coded things like that in both the data model and the business logic. Um, in Drupal Commerce. Um, then we also rely on essential contributed modules um, that really round out the feature set. So we really tried to be minimalistic in what we included in the core feature set of Commerce. Um, for example, there is no shipping module in the core of Commerce. It's a standalone project. There is no PayPal or authorized.net module or any other payment module because the core framework is really just about defining the basic systems and interfaces you need to do business online and then all of the modules um, that you know that we have for Drupal Commerce, there are several hundred offer payment method integration, shipping integration, um, different ways to promote and discount your products, um, integrate with third-party services like Mailchimp um, or other mailing services or marketing services, and some of these you know we consider as essential contribs. These are the ones that that we maintain. We put them into Commerce Kickstart, which is a distribution 
And so, you know, we're making sure that they're being maintained, kept up to date, certainly addressing any security issues. Um, and, you know, where possible, working with other community members to uh, keep these up to date and keep them all moving forward. And, you know, at the end of the day, um, we believe we're doing something right because, you know, we're up to about 55,000 or so sites reporting into Drupal.org as using Drupal Commerce. Um, of course, not all of those are live sites because Drupal.org statistics include, you know, development sites as well. Um, or maybe sites that use parts of the module but don't actually represent live stores. But in any event, there's thousands of sites that are using Drupal Commerce to power their online business. And I'm sure that there are many represented in this room here, including myself. I use it to sell cheese on the Internet. Um, so there's, you know, plenty, plenty of use cases out there. Um, but as I said, Commerce Kickstart is actually a distribution of Drupal that, that was built to round out the, the user experience um, for Drupal Commerce, because out of the box, it's really bare bones. It's just a teaser list, and that's it. There's nothing, there, there's really nothing to look at when you install Commerce itself. Um, so we, we said, first of all, we wanted to, to optimize like the, the store administrator user experience, because again, bare bones Commerce out of the box, you know, requires you to do things like um, manage your product SKUs in one place, and then your product displays in another, and reference, you know, link them together via a reference field. Um, within Kickstart, you know, we have the inline entity form module that, you know, can, can actually let you edit both entities on one form. Um, a few other things, like using um, a, a new module we wrote called the Views Mega Row module, which lets you look at a view. This one is um, orders, and you can actually expand, um, you know, any row to include just a, a summary of the order and update the order status. Things, you know, just things like that that make the, the admin UX just a little better. Um, and all of these modules that we, you know, we use the inline entity form, entity referencing, of course, views bulk operations for commerce, the, the views mega row, those are all standalone um, projects that you can use outside of commerce. And so if you have an existing Drupal commerce site and want to optimize the administrator user experience, you could look at Commerce Kickstart, find the modules, put them into your project, and, and you know, not have to worry about using the full distribution. Um, on the front end, um, we also created a, a fully responsive theme, including add to cart forms and checkout and everything. And then optimized you know, product pages with a few best practices, big pretty images, um, and a fully, um, a fully functioning uh, faceted product search um, that was built using the search API, facet API, views, um, and then of course you know, can connect it to solar on the back end if you want to. Um, and uh, f for this we did just some, just some neat things like um, added support for price field facets, so you could have like a you know a range of prices that you're searching for, that kind of thing. Um, and it also it also really demonstrates how to create a search index um, for you know using Search API that combines both product data and node data. If you're using a, a node to display product information, that's essential. Um, so you can look into here to see how we constructed that index if you're curious. Um, and then finally, we also built into the back end. Um, what we called the, the marketplace, which is just an easy way to find all of those modules that I've mentioned that either integrate with um, you know, third-party services who have partnered with us to make sure that the integrations are, are robust and supported. Um, and then we also link to you know, a variety of just community-contributed modules that would also improve the, um, the store UX. Um, so once again, you know, we like to see the graph going up. Um, there are about 13,000 or so um, sites reporting usage of Commerce Kickstart. Um, and that's a, you know probably probably more weighted toward demonstration sites and test sites um, than commerce itself, um, but there are you know a fair number of uh, examples even in our showcase on DrupalCommerce.org, where people successfully took the distribution, put a different theme on it, and then were able to launch a store very quickly. Um, so, you know we 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 have positive indicators that what we're doing is is useful. We're headed in the right direction, and uh, this talk is all about the things that we believe we can do better um, on Drupal 8. Um, are, are there any questions? I can pause here just about like um, Drupal Commerce itself or Commerce Kickstart the distribution, um, or should I just jump right in? Okay, so I'm obviously happy to answer more afterwards. Um, and uh, of course, if you have any other inf you know questions, you can always go to DrupalCommerce.org and read the documentation that Josh has produced, um, or you know find questions and answers there. Or even there's a, a pretty vibrant. Uh, group of folks in the Drupal Stack Exchange, if you go to drupal.stackexchange.com, that answers a lot of Drupal Commerce related questions, myself included. So Drupal Commerce 2.x, um, 
is, of course, going to be on Drupal 8. And um, one of the first questions that comes up when we start talking about D8 is, well, when will Drupal Commerce be ready? Um, and it's really impossible to say. It's obviously dependent on Drupal 8 being ready. Um, the good news is that we'll have fewer dependencies we have to wait for um, before we can consider Drupal Commerce you know, ready for use. Um, I'm not sure who was following along progress during the Drupal 7 development cycle, um, but we actually were writing Drupal Commerce at the same time that Views was unstable and Rules was in alpha and the Entity API was changing on a weekly basis, and so we were always having to, to, to rush to keep up with the changes. And that's not the case in Drupal 8 because, of course, Views is in core, um, and we are not going to have a hard dependency on rules anymore. We'll, it will, it will um, obviously enhance you know, your, your ability to customize the store, but we, we've just decided that um, we won't hold up the release of Drupal Commerce for a release of rules. Um, and, and, of course, the Entity API is much more robust in Drupal 8 than it was in Drupal 7. So a lot better tools means we'll have a, a Drupal Commerce release a lot sooner after the Drupal 8 release. Um, but I, I don't have, like... A date. I just tell the, my, I tell my, my salespeople not to uh, not to sell any Drupal 8 project until at least you know the second half of this year. Probably wouldn't be able to launch anything until you know early next year. That depends on a lot of other contributed modules in the Drupal space. Um, but to start, you know, Drupal Commerce 2.x development, um, we actually uh, gathered a crew in our, our office in Paris um, to host a sprint um, that was really based around validating the architecture of the core Commerce framework itself. Um, but also our strategy of using standalone PHP libraries and using Composer to pull those into Drupal um, to, as, as dependencies for the modules themselves. And um, we actually had um, a variety of contributors from other um, e-commerce um, projects, and then um, a few other Drupal guys, and also the creator of Symphony himself, Fabien Potentier, um, came by to give us his input. And um, the, the, the one bit of feedback that I remember verbatim was that he said, I'm glad I'm not developing an e-commerce solution. This sounds really hard. <laughs> um, but he was, he was very helpful in just helping us understand you know, how to create our, our, our libraries in such a way that not only are they useful to us, but they're also useful to Symfony. And therefore, other Symfony-based e-commerce projects, um, such as Sonata. Um, he's from the Sonata project. Um, and we had a few other um, Symfony-based projects represented as well. And, and have even seen since this time uptake in collaboration from other PHP-based e-commerce developers, which has been a huge win for us. Um, so once again, we are starting from scratch um, with a clean repository, much like we did on Drupal 7. And uh, that's you know just because everything is different. Dru the, the difference between Drupal 7 code and Drupal 8 code is is as stark as you know as big as the difference between Drupal 7 code and like Drupal 4.6. Like it's it's really really different. Um, and so we're, we're starting from scratch to take the opportunity to re-architect around the new, um, you know, concepts and, uh, and, and uh, programming models and whatnot that you have in, in Drupal 8, just simply because we're using object-oriented programming now with namespaces and dependencies and symphony components and a variety of other things that we wanted to make sure we were making the best use of them instead of just kind of carrying forward our old hooks and our old data structures. Um, so we started by reviewing the entity uh, model. So our, our entity diagram for commerce 1.x looks like this. We have five entity types that we define in commerce. That's the order, the product, the line item, the payment transaction, and the customer profile. Um, we define a few different field types like the product reference field, the customer profile reference field, um, and the price field. And that's it. That's all that the, the core of commerce 1.x defines out of the box. And we actually decided that um, you know, one entities are easier and cheaper to define now, um, thanks to the you know the um, the patterns we can follow in Drupal 8, and so we decided to add a few more entity types to the mix. This is a little bit out of date, um, but the gist is, um, you know, we won't be including variants as a standalone um, entity type, and we'll actually have one or two other payment-related entity types in core. But the the big idea is that you'll have a store entity through which everything is you know managed. So products belong to a store. And this would hold your global configuration for the site, like store logos, email addresses, contact information, and that sort of stuff. Um, so my products would be related to that. Orders would also be related to stores. So then you can end up with a multi-store scenario where access control is governed by what store a product or an order belong to. We'll be using um, you know, payment transactions, but then separately payment allocations that sort of divvy up you know, maybe one large transaction to the invoices that, those, that that actually covers. 
Um, we also have an entity type already in Commerce 2 um, that we're using to represent your, your uh, card on file data. So the, the payment tokens that you would use to process recurring transactions or card on file payments. And, and a few other things going on. Um, but you know, the, the other you know, basic ones remain product orders, customer profiles, payment transactions, and line items. Um, but we're going to change the way that some of those work together. Um, and also, um, thanks to the fact that Drupal 8 now has the entity reference field in core, um, which was developed for Drupal Commerce on D7, um, we no longer have our, our custom reference fields to relate these together, just entity reference fields, no more customer profile reference field or line item reference field or anything like that. So the, the first big entity change that we brought is, is to really um, implement a hierarchical product model um, that does not depend on nodes for displaying products. Um, so I'm, I'm not sure how familiar everyone is with um, products on Drupal 7 in commerce, but whenever you define a product entity, it doesn't have a, a front-end URL by default. You have to create that by creating a node and then associating that node to a SKU or a set of SKUs using a product reference or an entity reference field. And then we look at the, the products that you've referenced and we will sort of create the hierarchy on the fly as part of the add to cart forms logic. Um, so if you have a, a product with attributes like sizes of a shirt, you would reference the individual SKUs and then the add to cart form knows that you should render this group of products on the add to cart form with a select list for choosing a size. So pretty simple, but, but what, it, what it ends up doing is it, it doesn't, uh, it, it makes you have to manage a lot more data at the point of display. So it would be nice, for example, if I could, if I could just reference the parent product and have it include every you know, product um, in the group. Um, so that's one thing that we, we probably could implement on Commerce One. We just, you know, nobody's done it yet. Um, but it also would be nice if we just didn't need nodes at all. Um, so the, the idea here is that in Drupal 7, we continued to use nodes as product displays because nodes were still very important. You needed nodes if you wanted to have comments. A lot of other modules were, were still built around a node-based, um, you know, um, uh, uh, node-based content model. That, that we, we just didn't feel comfortable at the time, and this was 2010, um, just abandoning nodes entirely. But we knew that products still needed to be a standalone entity type, and we still needed to define individual variations of a product as unique SKUs for accounting and fulfillment purposes. Um, but now we believe that that um, you know, the Entity API has advanced such that we don't need nodes anymore as a sort of in intermediate layer. And we will just instead support products having their own you know, URL in the front end, you know, product slash one, product slash two. Um, that, of course, similar to Path Auto, you would be able to create you know, URL tokens for those. Um, but what we want is to be able to define a hierarchy for my product type and choose at which point in the hierarchy should a unique URL be created. So I might have um, a URL that lets me choose the color of my shirt and the size, or for the same product, you know, um, product group, I could, do, I could support both the combined interface and standalone interfaces if I wanted to. Um, we haven't actually programmed that all yet, but we have designed it and have the user interface mocked up, and this is where we're headed. Um, and the big win here is, is for the, uh, the bulk creation and management of groups of SKUs, because right now you have to manually essentially enter in all of the different variations and then reference them in. Um, what we would prefer to do is to define the hierarchy and create a new group and have it automatically create all of the different SKUs beneath it and, and you know, manage, the, oh, there goes my, <laughs> just long enough that I went to sleep, sorry. <clears throat> and it's probably gonna take a second to come back now, naturally. Are there any questions about products while this is coming back on? Yeah? I'll, I'll repeat the questions. Okay. Uh, Yeah, so the question was, um, how, how might we make uh, Drupal 8, um, you know, Commerce 2.x on Drupal 8 more friendly out of the box um, since we aren't dependent on this node-based configuration? And, um, you know, it, immediately, you know, just by the fact that every product will have a URL by default, you know, as far as a merchant is concerned, 
they're adding a product page, and once they do that, like it has a URL, and they, they don't have to, you know, they don't have to manage references or any other, you know, content type configuration or anything. Um, I'm not sure that we'll have like a, a catalog out of the box. Although since views is in core, I guess we, we could have just like a disabled view that could be enabled or something like that. Um, I, but I'm, I'm not sure just how rich the out-of-the-box experience would be. Um, so certainly open to feedback on anything that you think might, um, you know, enrich the product, you know, catalog management experience and be, you know, broadly applicable to a majority of users. Um, but, you know, it's, it's kind of hard to know because, you know, a, a lot of different vertical markets have very different needs out of their product model. Um, if anything, though, like it would make the most sense to, to optimize for, you know, a physical-based product catalog. And, you know, I wouldn't have a problem even having multiple different types of catalog views. Um, but maybe that would be best as even a standalone module um, just because you could, you know, change it faster. Um, well, that, that's, that's really it so far. Um, any other questions that uh, would be related to products or... Come again? Yeah, so the, the question is about uh, data mining and business intelligence, you know, plugins. I, I, to be honest, I mean, we certainly aren't thinking there yet as, as we're just building out the core framework. Um, you know, the uh, Drupal Commerce on Drupal 7 has the giraffe module now available for it, which provides, um, you know, good intelligence about usage of the website. So it has your... Uh, you know, conversion funnels, your conversion rate optimization, and a n nice dashboard. It you know, shows what products convert more and all that kind of stuff. So I, w I would look into that. It's, it's giraffe with a J. So J-I-R-A-F-E. And that, that might be a good place to start. Um, so another thing that we want to do um, beyond just making it easier to build out your product catalog and manage your you know, product database is to actually have uh, more opinions about checkout user experience. I mean, Commerce 1.x, we, we basically just, we, we didn't do much to support uh, um, checkout best practices beyond allowing you to basically choose between anonymous versus authenticated only checkouts. Um, so there's no reason for us not to have that, or at least, you know, yeah, it, it would be a block so it could be moved around, disabled, whatever. Um, but but to, to bring more, you know, uh, conversion-oriented tools like this to the core framework would be useful. Um, but also... Um, we want to be able to actually support uh, multivariate testing or split A-B testing on the checkout form, um, or even just multiple checkout paths based on the product that's being purchased. Um, so, so just to, to um, explain a little further, in Drupal Commerce right now, you have one checkout form configuration, and you can alter it using an alter hook, but it's, it's really kind of flaky. It's, it's not the best system for um, you know, creating a different uh, checkout experience whether, you know, whether because you want to do A-B testing or because you have a different checkout workflow for um, uh, your B2B customers versus B2C, you know, wh whatever it is, like we, we just want to support that. And the way that we'll do that is ideally by using Drupal's form modes. Um, so I'm, I'm not sure how familiar we are with Drupal 8, um, but in Drupal 7 you have the concept of view modes where any node, for example, could be displayed as a teaser or as a full page or as a search result or an RSS you know, entry. Um, Drupal 8 extends this concept of different ways to display the rendered content to supporting different ways to display the edit form. Um, and since the checkout form is really just an order edit form that may or may not have multiple steps, um, we believe that we can use form modes to define you know, both the, the back-end order editing interface and the front-end checkout um, workflows. And then basically just have the checkout module you know, give you some sort of mechanism to, to choose or indicate which particular form mode should be used for this current user. Um, so I, I do believe it's going to be possible, but again, I haven't actually researched it yet and tried to implement it. Um, if anybody has worked with form modes, I'd love to hear about your experience. Um, but the idea would then be to, to not have to maintain any more our drag and drop checkout form builder, but just build that all into the form modes interface and you know, have one less thing that's unique to commerce and, and just be more natively using Drupal concepts. And we're also going to, to be uh, very um, uh, uh, more controlled around how orders can be updated um, from like status to status. Um, so right now in commerce and Ubercart before it, um, we basically just implemented um, order status updates as a select list. So any administrator can go in 
and change a value in a select list and basically say this order is now canceled, this order is now complete. But there is no, there is no check and balance that um, ensures that this order was paid for or that a refund was issued. And so really when, when we're dealing with, with an order, it has a very complex workflow that needs to be more defined and controlled with state transitions um, that actually control moving from one status to another and, and don't support you know, invalid transitions. So you wouldn't be able to move from a completed order to a canceled order without first going through a refund step, that sort of thing. And the model or the, the paradigm that I'm following here is the, um, has, has anybody used JIRA for project management? Yeah, so in JIRA, every project can have any number of types of issues and the issue has an assigned workflow. And in this workflow, you define the steps, you define the state transitions, you give them a name. So as a developer, I come in and I say start progress and it moves it to the in progress status. And then I can either stop progress or um, you know, complete it or mark it as done. But these, these buttons actually give me um, sort of a, a user interface uh, uh, text to put on the button that you would use to initiate the state transition. There might be, you know, in this transition, some intermediate form we have to put in additional information or, you know, explain why you're reopening a closed issue, that kind of stuff. And so that this, this sort of um, functionality is what we are now implementing for orders so that no longer can you just randomly move an order from one state to another, um, nor would you be able to sort of daisy chain together um, via rules, you know, a bunch of different order status updates because that actually gets you into trouble on Commerce 1.x. Um, just because, you know, it, it's, it's really difficult through rules to manage the dependencies of one state automatically, you know, moving to another, to another, to another. Um, and so this is actually already um, uh, being worked on in a workflow module. I don't think it's on Drupal.org yet. I think it might just be in Pedro Canberra's GitHub. Um, but we'll be, you know, continuing to flesh this out ideally as a standalone like entity workflow module, one of which does already exist on Drupal 7, so we're pursuing you know, either reusing that or making this part of the roadmap for that project. Um, but then we will implement it specifically for orders, and I have a hunch that we'll also implement it for line items because oftentimes the order status is derived from the line item statuses. So an, an order is shipped whenever all of the line items have been actually shipped. So in the case of like a back-ordered um, product, you wouldn't mark the order as complete until all of the you know, products have come into the warehouse and shipped out and so on. Um, so we're, we're, I'm really excited about this because there are just a lot of things that, that, we, um, that, that aren't easy with the way order statuses work in Commerce One. And I have a blog post about it that I haven't published for like six months, so shame on me. I need to, I'll, I'll make sure I do that um, after this conference. Um, finally, we, we uh, are not finally, we do want to support discounts in core. This is the current um, commerce discount user interface, which I'm not a huge fan of. Um, but the concept is good, which is that um, just throwing a merchant at the rules user interface is a losing strategy for happy customers. Because um, none, you know, none of our merchants are, are equipped to, to navigate the rules UI and not break something and manage their discounts that way. And so the discounts module in Commerce 1.x provides a, a simpler user interface with the, abil the ability to still use some conditions, and it also integrates with the coupon module and a few other things. Um, but we're actually pursuing better opportunities to support discounts in core. And finally, um, because of the addition of the store entity to the core of Commerce 2.x, um, we will support both multi-store and multi-vendor scenarios out of the box. Um, so right now there's the Commerce Marketplace module that facilitates some of this. Um, but, but for an example is in Commerce 1, um, you cannot um, say like uh, e easily use different payment credentials. If you had a, a multi-vendor website where I was supplying my PayPal credentials and wanted customers buying from me to, to submit payment to my PayPal account, that's actually a little bit difficult in Commerce 1 and, and does require the, the Commerce Marketplace module to provide both a, a, a user interface where merchants can enter their, their credentials, but also um, kind of hack around some limitations in the payment method API to make that work. A another big thing, though, is, um, and we're not sure how far we're going to, to go down this rabbit hole, is that uh, a multi-store or a multi-seller website needs to decide what it should do when um, customers try to order products from multiple vendors. You know, should it be two separate shopping carts? Should it just all be one? Who actually gets paid? Who's responsible for, for, for fulfillment? Um, we haven't answered all of those questions to decide just how much we'll support in core and how much we'll depend on contributed modules for. 
Um, but again, you know, if that's a discussion that's relevant to you, um, you know, Boyan would be more than happy to discuss that. I'm happy to discuss that. Um, at the very least, we'll have the, the data types in the core of commerce that we need to support any scenario. Um, but you know, when it comes to systems and interfaces, we're not quite decided. Um, so as far as actual progress goes, um, I'm not sure if I should try this live or not. So looking at Drupal 8 right now, um, I, I do have a commerce menu item where I can come and access my store. Uh, because the resolution is so low, it's using the sidebar, so it's not going to look great up here. Um, but you know, you, you, you can create orders, you can create products. They have no fields and no information on them that's useful, but the, in, the, the entities are there. The pattern has been set so that we can continue to define all of our entity types. Um, and then you can also you know, do some, some configuration, like manage your currencies and import, um, you know, import currency settings, import um, um, you know, tax settings, number formats, and the like. And then also set your, your store information, which is where you manage your store entities and their fields. Um, so this is the, the current status of things. Um, there's no front-end work yet as far as add-to-cart form or checkout form goes. Um, and that's kind of on me. So I'll, I'll be looking to do that over the next few months and hopefully have a great demo for DrupalCon LA. Are, are there any feature-related questions um, you know, as it pertains to the, the development of commerce on Drupal 8 right now? Okay, let, let's talk about what may be the, actually the most exciting part of Drupal Commerce on Drupal 8. We are actually, um, you know, when, whenever we you know, got, got wind that Drupal 8 was adopting Symfony and that you know, there would be Composer as a core concept now for managing a Drupal site, that got you know, our gears going where we, we realized, well, we have the opportunity now to move functionality from our modules out into standalone libraries where um, we can still depend on them in our modules, but we can also invite other projects to collaborate around them and influence the development of other projects and bas basically collaborate around the essential things for doing business online that, that aren't specific to Drupal and certainly don't need to be specific to, to our solution. Um, so we, we started out by researching you know, the, the deficiencies in our own, in our own software we, we looked into um, pre-existing price management and currency management libraries, pre-existing e-commerce bundles for Symfony, even some non-Symfony, and even non-PHP based applications to see who is solving things like locale specific currency formatting and locale management, um, address formatting and validation, uh, price management and currency management, that, all that stuff. And um, you know, Boyan Zivanovich, I, I mentioned previously, is our commerce2.x um, you know, maintainer. Uh, my co-maintainer in Drupal Commerce now in general, and um, he's also an e-commerce machine, and he just hammered out this research over the course of a couple of weeks. And um, basically just identified some age-old tax management issues um, as, as deficiencies that we could address in generic solutions. Um, a price management API that doesn't actually really have an API. Um, right now, if you're manipulating prices in Drupal Commerce, you, you have to really interface or interact with a... Um, the, the data array of a price field to set your price components. And we just never really finished the API around that. Um, also, every new point release of Drupal Commerce brings with it yet another currency that we didn't support previously in terms of formatting it you know, appropriately for that locale. Um, but even, even with every currency covered, we still wouldn't um, accommodate the fact that each, uh, each country may render the same currency differently. So the euro looks differently from country to country around Europe much like the peso is going to be rendered differently from a formatting standpoint from country to country. Um, and the dollar between the U.S. and uh, Canada and Australia, you know, it's, it's just we don't have support for that right now in our, our currency API. Um, we also have really abused the um, address field implementation um, for managing addresses. And um, Boyan has actually improved it based on our library work. Um, but, but it just was difficult, again, to customize address formats to know in advance which countries require you to select a state, which ones depend on a postal code, where is you know, different fields optional, all that kind of stuff. And, and also, we identified as a weakness not something to do with our code, but really just to do with our community, which was we had a, a real inability to collaborate with other PHP app, you know, developers um, that are doing e-commerce because all of our logic and all of our you know, all of our just sort of knowledge that we've amassed over the last six or seven years of doing e-commerce was locked away in our Drupal modules. So not useful to any other project. And we wanted to fix those things. Um, so we proposed standalone solutions for internationalization, which is managing locales 
and then also managing number formatting for each locale, and then additionally extending that to currency formatting that's locale specific. Um, we also proposed to solve once and for all um, address form generation, validation, and locale specific um, formatting for every country in the world. Lofty goal. Um, we um, also proposed to support territory grouping for the sake of simplifying taxing, shipping, payment selection, all that stuff. Um, and then also, as far as we can, um, encapsulate like tax rate management and price calculation and manipulation in standalone libraries. Um, I'm not sure um, how relevant European style VAT management is to Latin American stores, but I'm definitely happy to talk about that afterwards. Um, so we, um, you know, we knew that we didn't want to just create, so based on Boyan's research, again, presenting on behalf of him, we, we did know that we weren't going to just produce a set of interfaces that other applications had to develop and provide all of the logic and data for. We also wanted to bundle in unprecedented data, like all of the address formatting rules for every country in the world. That's unprecedented um, for any you know, e-commerce library anywhere as far as we know. Um, we also decided we wanted minimal dependencies, so we weren't going to create these as symphony bundles and you know, make them dependent on other things. Um, we certainly weren't going to make them dependent on Drupal or its APIs. Um, we certainly are, are striving for simple APIs with clear documentation and examples you know, for everything um, and full test coverage, so that's a very high goal. Uh, actually, this is interesting. In doing the, um, the address library, our test coverage has, has turned up um, uh, actual bugs in the data source that we were using. And um, we have been improving our data source that we're now you know, consuming for all of our um, address rules. It's been, it's been fun to see how that's worked out. Uh, finally, we wanted these to be reusable by any PHP-based e-commerce application. Um, so we started with Commerce Guys INTL. And this was a PHP 5.4 um, internationalization library powered by data from CLDR, which manages um, number formatting rules for every country and locale in the world. Um, and so we, we built a library, um, and we set it up to manage you know, countries, currencies, languages, etc., and then also have number formatting rules and currency formatting rules for everywhere. Um, and it was so good um, that Symfony is actually adopting um, our internationalization um, library into the core of Symfony itself um, in future versions. And even now in the current long-term support version, um, they've been accepting patches from Boyan, which is a huge win. So we're not just feeding off of Symfony, we're also feeding back into Symfony. So really creating a very healthy partnership. Um, so the, the, the um, CLDR project just sort of um, lets us know exactly how to render you know, the dollar, the euro, the peso, any currency that, that can have you know, different formatting for different regions, you know, the, the proper way for every country in the world. Um, and that's already done, and we've already used it to improve the currency um, definitions in Commerce 1.x. Um, then we have the pricing library, um, which provides a price object where we are managing the storage, the formatting, display, etc., of um, a price, which in Commerce is defined as a numeric amount with a currency code. And then right now we just support rendering that in one format for you know, each currency. Here it will be locale-specific currency formatting with um, additional um, class methods for managing like uh, manipulating the price and tracking changes to a price object over time. So exactly what in Commerce 1.x we use price components for. Um, there's, there's a bit of a holy grail goal here, um, which is to also be able to, um, to properly apply discounts relative to taxes and that sort of thing. Um, but that, that may be stretching a bit far for a generic library. Um, and then the one that, that I thought was you know, most exciting was the addressing library. Um, we found a data set from the Android SDK um, that Google uh, let us reformat and relicense. I can't remember the license, BSD or something. They let us um, reformat it from this, their giant flat file into JSON files, um, put it out under an MIT license, and now use that to do form generation and val validation through Symfony's um, you know, form generators and validators. Uh, and then also do, um, uh, again, locale-specific um, ordering of the elements on the address form and then rendering when you actually print it out for display on the screen versus print it out for um, usage on a label. So all of that stuff, the data set had that knowledge, and we've now converted that into JSON files that we're consuming by this library to build all of our address forms for commerce. And, and now we're getting other e-commerce projects to use this same library and build into it. Again, you know, just the, the power of the community is going to, to drive its, you know, its, its accuracy and its feature set over time. Um, and so this... You know, being able, being able to get that was a huge win. Boyan's written about it on the Drupal Commerce blog. 
Um, and again, this, this solves so many problems for so many people um, that you know, we, we really can't wait to start using it now. And you've already begun to use this data set to improve all of our address formatting rules for address field on um, Drupal Commerce 1.x. Um, and so I'm, I'm not sure, you know, this is just one example um, where uh, the, the address form that's generated, one is dependent on the country because you have different fields that are going to be required for each country. Some countries have, you know, provinces and cities you have to select, some don't. Um, in some cases, the postal code might be all that you need to submit an address form, that kind of thing. Um, but, you know, how it's rendered might actually differ based on the, the language you're using to build the form. So in this case, this is a Chinese address rendered in English. And so they, um, they have the address go from basically like specific to broad. So, you know, my name followed by my company, my street address, district, city, province, and postal code. Um, and that's maybe a, maybe a more traditional like Western sort of ordering of the address fields. Uh, but if you were viewing the same form in Chinese, it would actually reverse, um, you know, the, the postal code, province, city, and district so that you're selecting them in reverse order. Um, for Japanese addresses, you also have to select a, uh, a title. So not just my, my first and last name, but am I Mr., Mrs., Doctor, etc. So all of these you know, different um, requirements from each country for each locale are already working in the addressing library and being used by live projects right now. Um, so super, super exciting. Um, and you know, huge kudos to Boyan for driving that forward. And um, you know, also to Damien, our CTO, for finding the data set and convincing Google to let us relicense that and redistribute it. Um, I mentioned we had the zone library. and This is just handling grouping territories together. So for example, you might have one payment method for any country in the EU, um, but a different payment method for all international orders. Or the same might apply to Latin American countries where you're using the pay you as a payment method for only specific countries in South America, but then internationally using some other payment method like PayPal or something. Um, but it also lets us do fun things like uh, oh, well, shoot, um, like prepare international tax zones. So I, I, I know I've heard that uh, you know taxes in Colombia can be difficult to implement and report on after the fact. Well, it's even worse elsewhere. Um, in the U.S., you know, we're we're a total mess. But even you know, in the EU, where VAT is supposed to be simpler to account for, you literally have a German VAT that applies to any German address, but also five postal codes in Austria. Um, which means you have, to be, you have to know that when you're you know, calculating tax for the order, and you have to know the inverse. So if you're calculating Austrian VAT, it applies to Austria except those five postal codes. And the good thing is that all of these types of groupings are predefined, they, and they don't change that often. So the PHP library, um, you know, the, the zone library can mount the tax library, just sort of codifies this knowledge, and then we'll again crowdsource it and get these other people that are developing other solutions that are specific to different markets to contribute to these definitions and help us keep them up to date and you know, help us make better use of them in our own software. Um, and you know, once again, we feel like we're doing something right. Whenever we put out the addressing library for a, a bright, shining moment, we were the top trending developer on GitHub. Uh, and that is, of course, because all of these libraries are hosted on GitHub. Um, and you can go find them, fork them, contribute to them. Um, we'd be more than happy to have you use them, whether it's in a Drupal project or not. Um, we're already seeing collaboration around the tax library from um, other systems like Foxycart. And um, shoot, there was a new one, Kong, recently that started to adopt the library. Um, so we're, we're getting good participation and expect to see that continue to grow. Um, before I move on, are there any questions about the, uh, the libraries or you know, where those stand or what we're up to with those? Yeah, so the question is, you know, how then, since these are all hosted on GitHub as standalone libraries, do we get them into Drupal? And um, right now, the installation process requires the Composer Manager module, which is a standalone module for Drupal 8 that basically reads all of your contributed modules, looking for a, a, a composer.json file, and then updates the composer.json in your Drupal 8 vendor directory to, or in your Drupal 8 directory to. Uh, um, to include all of the necessary dependencies. So it does just a bit of dependency negotiation, make sure there aren't any duplicates. But then ultimately, when you run your composer update, it's putting all of those dependencies in the one core, or the one vendor brand, or bleh, the one vendor directory that Drupal 8 is using um, to fetch all of the other libraries and components that it's depending on. 
Um, so it's a bit of a manual process right now. Ideally, that will become more automatic because it's a bit of a stretch to require everyone running this to also go in and you know, install a Composer and do the updates and all that kind of stuff. Um, but that's, that's where things stand right now. Any other questions about libraries before I move on? All right, so Boyan Zivanovich is, is leading the development on these and giving you know, Drupal a great name in other um, you know, open source communities um, and also you know, finding good partners to collaborate around them. So huge kudos to him. Um, finally, at, at Commerce Guys, you know, we're, not, we're not just concerned about improving um, the, uh, the data model behind our modules themselves, but also improving the, tool, the tooling that we have to, to build and deliver commerce projects. And um, you know, we believe that commerce projects are somewhat unique in the Drupal realm in the sense that they um, are exposed to more rapid changes. Um, they oftentimes have more rigorous and more involved testing, uh, um, testing processes. And uh, you, know, you also have to you know, very often respond to the midnight whims of your merchants that want to see a new type of discount or promotion or whatever deployed immediately the next day so that they can run a sale or something. Um, so we, we ask ourselves the questions a lot. How, how do we actually um, manage and scale com complex e-commerce applications, especially when you know, the code base is stretched across Drupal.org, GitHub, public repositories, private repositories, site-specific code? How, how do we actually manage that so that we don't take down someone's store right when they're ready to take you know, a sale live? Um, you know, additionally, how can we continue to deliver new features without disrupting existing shopping sessions? Because the last thing you want is to you know, take the site down for maintenance um, to you know, roll out a new update when somebody's in the middle of you know, putting in their credit card information. Um, uh, additionally, you know, um, merchants are often non-technical, or almost always non-technical, but they still want to be able to do QA and see a, a live preview of the code, you know, the code changes that we're making in an exact replica of their live environment. Um, and oftentimes that includes all of the data, whether it's you know, products, users, customer profiles, et cetera. That's just kind of what they need. And so these sorts of things, um, are, they're, they're, they're not specific to e-commerce. Any Drupal project is going to have similar requirements, but we found it to be especially true for our commerce projects. And that, so the, answering those questions drives a lot of like, our philosophy and approach to platform.sh, um, which is just our, our Drupal-based platform as a service that basically manages your code base via a Drush make file. Um, so you can pull in you know, uh, any, any project from D.O, from GitHub, from private repositories, using a project-specific SSH key. Um, you can apply patches and basically just manage your code base uh, with, with a lot more transparency into what is actually compiled into the project. So I can just look at my, you know, my project.make file and see all of the contributed modules that you know, Josh has added since the last time that you know, we rolled out a new version of a customer website. Um, then once you do that, you, you commit a change and push it up to platform. It actually rebuilds the entire environment, but it doesn't go down. It just sort of puts the um, you know, pending HTTP request in a bit of a loop um, while it uh, basically rebuilds the environment and then deploys it. So your customers might see a bit of a lag, but nobody's actually losing a session or the site's not apparently going down, even while you're rolling out new features um, you know, in, in real time. So th there are a few other things that um, you know, Platform brings to the table. Uh, r related to, to QA, of course, we have um, just a, a branching strategy where any branch you create in your repository has a live environment for someone to do QA on. Um, and you can branch you know, in any, any number of ways that you want to. And we, we maintain the uh, parent-child relationship between your branches so you can basically create any number of workflows for developing, testing, and deploying new changes to the live site. Um, we've also optimized it um, uh, uh, both for Drupal and Commerce projects and just for bare -bones Symphony projects, um, basically deploying a different tool stack depending on what type of project you're identifying you know, your, your application as. Um, so in your Git repository, you have these YAML configuration files where you say I'm Drupal 8 versus Drupal 7 and then Git Composer and Drush and a few other tools out of the box. Or say you're Symfony and then you just get Composer and no Drush, no anything else. Um, and, and the idea is that you're actually managing um, your, the services that you're using, including PHP, MariaDB, Solar, etc., cetera, um, from these configuration files so you can actually deploy like, like a, a whole new feature set, a whole new service to your live site. So from an e-commerce standpoint, that might mean turning on a faceted search powered by solar, but you would want to test that downstream, enable the solar service, configure it, tweak it, and then immediately roll out the infrastructure change to the live website at the same time as you roll out the code and configuration change. And so that's what platform.sh enables you to do. Um, if anybody's interested in giving it a whirl, I'm happy to you know, hand out free voucher codes or whatever. Um, 
But that's, so that's all that we're up to, um, to support Drupal, Drupal Commerce and e-commerce in general. On Drupal 8, it involves both uh, you know, the framework itself and the Drupal modules. It involves standalone libraries. And it involves improving the, the tools and processes that we use to actually manage these projects together. Um, if there are any questions, I'm happy to field them now. Otherwise, we can go find more coffee. Yeah. Do we have any data about market penetration? No, not particularly. I mean, I, I only have a few examples of stores that I know that have launched. Um, I know that the Lush website just launched in Brazil. And that was you know, started in London and then rolled out through a local partner in Brazil. That's the, probably the largest one that I know about. And then you know, just a handful of other smaller projects that we see come in. So. All right, well, I'm happy to hang around and take questions you know, after the session is over, if you're camera shy or whatever. Um, but thank you very much for your attention, and hope you have a good rest of your day.